Onk Live Insights is a video editorial program produced by Onk Live. So it sounds like in the refractory setting, it's a very difficult decision, particularly in the absence of a biomarker. So, for instance, how do you make a decision between pomalidomide, carfilzomib, or other agents in the refractory setting? So that's a great question, and I don't think I necessarily have a good answer for that. But, you know, when I'm looking at these drugs and then looking at a patient uh, in front of me, there are certain things, at least clinically, that you can uh, kind of come up with in terms of where you'd prefer to use one versus the other. Um, you know, pomalidomide, as I said, is convenient. It's oral. Um, but sometimes you need that prurisome inhibitor. And, you know, if you have a very aggressive relapse where the numbers are going up very quickly, I'd like to use carfilzomib. The other thing you have to look at is comorbidities. If I have somebody who has uh, a lot of myelosuppression to begin with, um, knowing that the toxicity of pomalidomide is going to be further myelosuppression, you know, one could argue and say, you know, I might go and use carfilzomib, which, which would be a little less myelosuppressive in that setting. In contrast, if I have somebody who has a lot of cardiac issues with, say, heart failure-related issues, I'd probably be a little less likely to use carfilzomib because of concerns around, you know, cardiac toxicity. So you can pick and choose. Having said that, you know, a lot of times we will combine drugs, and especially in the high-risk situation, we're actually combining both carfilzomib and pomalidomide, and this combination has been extremely potent in, um, uh, you know, whenever we've used it. We've seen great responses, and certain situations where you have the deletion 17, P53 mutated patients, you know, we do end up using those combinations. How do you make the difficult decision in choosing between pomalidomide or carfilzomib or other agents in later line settings? Yeah, so a lot of it, again, depends on that track record of what have they had and what are their toxicities. Uh, sometimes patients live far away, and so coming in for a twice a week infusion with carfilzomib is a little bit of a challenge for those patients, and so we may try something oral for them first. Other patients, their copays for an oral agent may be really high, in which case we'll try and use a proteasome inhibitor like carfilzomib as an earlier line, knowing that ultimately patients are going to receive all these drugs as part of their overall treatment approach. Patients that I think are more uh, proteasome inhibitor sensitive, I may way towards using carfilzomib in the refractory setting. Patients that I know have been had good experiences with IMIDs in the past, I may lean more towards a, a pomalidomide-based approach. So when incorporating pomalidomide into your treatment regimen, do you typically continue its use until disease pro progression or unacceptable toxicity? Most of the time. Most of the time it's uh, disease progression. Uh, again, we, we are fairly aggressive with managing some of these uh, toxicities. Um, we manage cytopenias, GI side effects. Fatigue is, fatigue is very unique in our patient population, um, but we do have, we encourage patients to talk to us about what they're experiencing. We tell them what we're looking for in their labs, what we're looking for as far as side effect management. And again, we like to uh, keep patients on full dose agents uh, because they usually get good disease control. And if they're getting good disease control, that's, that's our goal. Um, you know, we want them to have a, a good disease status and a good quality of life. So we typically will discontinue the drug when there is disease progression. It's no longer working.